I am Pastor Kevin Sepulveda. Um, I am pastoring two churches currently. My main, like, I, like I mentioned earlier, the main church I pastor is New Life Baptist Church. I'm originally from Sydney and I was sent from Sydney by my uh, local church to start a church up there, which is New Life Baptist Church on the Sunshine Coast of uh, Queensland. The reason I chose the Sunshine Coast at the time, there was, at, from what I could understand from different uh, brethren that were there, there was no outreach, there was no uh, door-to-door gospel preaching that was occurring. And I really wanted to target an area that hadn't really had the chance to hear the gospel, at least not to hear the gospel for some time. And so that's the reason why we went to the Sunshine Coast. Now, um, let me give you a little bit of a brief history of how I came to know the Lord. I don't have some amazing testimony to tell you, except that I was born in a Christian home. Praise God for a Christian home, for Christian parents. And at the age of four, my mom gave me the gospel. Okay, And at four years old, I trusted Christ as my saviour. Um, I, I didn't commit some grievous sins when I was three or four. I simply knew him as the one that I needed. If mum and dad needed Jesus, then surely I needed Jesus Christ as well. And so I put my simple faith and trust on Jesus and his free gift of salvation. You see, little kids don't find it difficult to understand what a free gift is. You're always giving them birthday presents and what have you. And it's easy to receive a gift from, from the parents, open it up, and you're not thinking there's strings attached. You know it's free. It's completely paid for. And that's what I understood what Christ had done for me, that he had given me a free gift, completely paid for by his shed blood. And my simple faith on his death, burial, resurrection was sufficient for me to be assured that I'd go to heaven when I died. Amen. And so I knew that at four years old, praise God. And uh, so nothing fancy. And, uh, you know, from the beginning, we would attend Baptist churches. Uh, my first Baptist church was Cabramatta Baptist Church. And uh, it was a Baptist Union church. And as I was growing up, it started to head in a bit of an ugly direction. Uh, the preachers started to refer to the Roman Catholics as our brothers in the Lord. And I, just, I didn't like where they was headed. And so I thought when I was maybe in my, in my teenagers, I thought, I don't want to be a Baptist anymore. I did not understand really uh, that there were such things as independent Baptists and that there was this battle from, uh, you know, to, to, re- to remain true to the fundamentals of the faith. And um, so anyway, I, I, uh, in my teenage years, I got a little bit wayward because I wasn't really attending church that regularly. Uh, I came across um, a young lady by the name of Christina. I gave her the gospel. Uh, she's the first soul that I saw saved, praise God. And, uh, and then I married her. That's what you do, right? You find a nice young lady, she calls upon the Lord and trusts him as, your, as her saviour, so you get married. That's what you do. <laughs> and, uh, you know, praise God for my wife. Uh, we've been married for 20, I think we're coming to 21 years now. It's been definitely 20 years, so I remember that, celebrating 20 years. And uh, the Lord's blessed us with 12 children. Um, our youngest is just turned one a couple of weeks ago. And my eldest, she's 19, and she got married at the end of last year. So we went from 12 kids to 11. We felt like there was one missing, so we got a little pet dog uh, just recently. Just a little dog in the last month by the name of Luna, just to make up the numbers. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, with, with, the, uh, you know, with, the, with my wife being on board to one day start in the church, we went to the sunny coast, and we've been there for almost seven years. This coming October, it's, we're going to be celebrating our seven-year anniversary. And uh, now what happened was, um, like I said, I'm originally from Sydney and I, I knew brothers and sisters in the Lord of my sending church and without going into all of the details, something happened with my sending church, church politics, let's just say that, and we found people that were without a church and uh, my heart went out to them and I said to them, look, I'm willing to travel uh, for a midweek service just as a band-aid solution until we could f- figure out where you guys... Cause People were leaving church and they, they weren't attending church, they, didn't, they weren't in fellowship. And, you know, when you're not attending church and not in fellowship, you can really start to fall away um, in walking with the Lord. So my heart went out to them and uh, it began on a Tuesday. Uh, we were meeting for Tuesday services. I would fly down, I'd fly back up. It's not a big deal, really. Only an hour and a half flight, roughly, uh, between the sunny coast and Sydney. We'd run midweek services. Well, lo and behold, people started to be added to the church there and it's become its own uh, independent Baptist Church, Blessed Hope Baptist Church, and uh, that church has been operating for some six years uh, now. So, um, so that, 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 is, that is my heart. My heart really isn't so much a title or a position. You know, I've been serving the Lord since I was very young, and I just, I just have a heart for the people of God. I have a heart for my brothers and sisters in the Lord, because there's not that many of us, really. You know, uh, uh, the majority are on the broad way, on the broad way of destruction, and you know, for us to be able to change, especially Australia, which is not a very, 
spiritual nation. It's not a very Christ-fearing or God-fearing nation. I think, you know, we need to be able to work together with the brethren, with our saved brothers and sisters in the Lord, and, and just do a mighty work for the kingdom of Christ's sake um, here in Australia and even here in Port Macquarie. And um, so regarding Pastor Gary, you know, uh, well, let, let, let me just uh, begin by saying that a few months ago, Brother Sam reached out to me and he had mentioned that uh, Pastor Gary and the family were looking to uh, move on in a certain direction. And uh, there was a need for maybe leadership to come. And, you know, he reached out to me and said, look, pastor, do you have any men that are ready to step up to be a pastor? And, and uh, to be honest, if I did, I'd have a pastor at Blessed Up Baptist Church by now. <laughs> now, I'd love to. There are many men that have said I'd love to be a pastor one day. But, you know, it takes quite a bit of an effort, you know, to, to make sure that you line up with the qualifications in the scriptures, and I talk about this a lot, we don't want the qualifications in the Bible to be just some box that we tick. We want it to be part of our natural life, who we are, not just some box to qualify, oh, okay, I'm ready. No, it's got to be something deep down in the heart. And I often talk about Jesus Christ being the perfect example of a good shepherd, the great shepherd, and the heart of the shepherd to lay down his life for the sheep. So it's not so much about what you get out of being a pastor, but how can you lay down your life or how you, can you be sacrificial to the people of God? And of course, when it comes to that part of the, uh, the ministry, that, that's the challenging part, to be able to give of yourself sacrificially. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of demand for people who desire to be a pastor. And, you know, there are many churches in Australia that are lacking pastors. We ought to be praying for these churches that the Lord will add faithful men to those positions. And uh, anyway, when I started to wonder about the, the church here, I, I, I inquired and I heard about Pastor Gary Tinkson and immediately his surname rang a bell because some 20, I don't know, 25 years ago, I worked with his sister um, in the same company, um, Diana, Diana, and uh, I would talk to her about the Bible and, uh, and she'd say, man, you know who you'd get along with? My brother. You'd get along with my brother, Gary. And then I came across another, some other mutual friends of ours that uh, I met them, and I would talk to them about the Bible, and they'd say the same thing. They'd say, you reminded me a lot of uh, my friend Gary. Uh, you'd like to, you'd, you'd get to know, if you got to know him, you'd be a, you know, I reckon you guys would be good friends. And I was like, where is this Gary? Where is he? And uh, in the United States, apparently. So I'm like, well, come back. <laughs> is he coming back to you know? But, uh, well, I finally got to meet you some 20 years later. Praise God. And, <laughs> And uh, here's the thing, I really feel like I know you. I, re I really feel like I, I know you, because I've known about you. And uh, so that, that was really interesting. And, um, you know, I was thinking about this church and the need for pastors and leadership. And I was seeking the Lord, Lord, would you have me come in and, and be a help and be a support to this church? And then I found out that Brother Jordan was attending this church. And I was like, no way. You know, <laughs> and, and I, I don't know if you remember, Brother, but um, I, for those of you that know Jordan, you know this story is true. Like, you know his behavior would be true because uh, I think I either took you out soul winning, door to door soul winning the first time, or, or it's the first time you've seen a soul saved. It was the first soul I got saved. Oh, it was the first soul you got saved. Okay, well, he remembers better than I. Yeah. But anyway, we went door to door. There was a salvation. All right, it was you. I'll, I'll give yeah. you credit for that. <laughs> and then as we walked back, he jumped on my back. Uh, do you remember that? Yeah. He jumped on my back and bear hugged me like this. He was like, we got a soul saved. I'm like, I'm like calm down, calm down. <laughs> so it doesn't surprise me that he's got the loudest voice in this church. It doesn't surprise me that he's a song leader here. He's, yeah, he's got the big voice and he's got the, the passion and the zeal. So praise God for Brother Jordan. So um, just a, a few little connections. And, you know, the independent fundamental Baptist world is quite small, actually. <laughs> you know, a few people, you know, almost everybody. And, um, well, anyway, uh, you know, you guys have been on my mind. And I've been asking both New Life Baptist Church and Blessed Up Baptist Church to be praying for this church. I know how challenging it is to start a church from scratch, especially in a place... I mean, is it true that Port Macquarie has only got about 50,000 people, roughly, population? It's not. It's not a very big place. And, of course, it's going to be a, a, an extra challenge when there's less people than a, the big cities to grow a church and, and all these things. And, obviously, I'd love to come alongside and, and support you. And, you know, when I share the need to the, both churches, uh, especially with Blessed Baptist Church down in Sydney because it's much closer travel-wise, Everybody, just about every, everybody that, I, that responded to me said, hey, you know what, if this church needs some help, let's be a friend, let's go help them, let's be a blessing. And uh, in some ways, I think Blessed Up Baptist Church looks at New Life Baptist Church as a big brother, right? That big brothers come out here and they, they help us and they support us and they pray for us. 
And then Blessed Baptist Church was, we'd like to be a big brother one day. Like, <laughs> we'd like to be able to help another church and support them. And, and this could be an important part of our spiritual growth and, and development in the Lord. So, you know, um, I waited for Pastor Gary to uh, reach out to me, and uh, he did. And we spoke about the need here on Port Macquarie and a little bit about, about his, uh, you know, um, personal side of things and decisions why he's, he's making certain decisions in life. And, and I, I can fully understand, you know, uh, ministry can pull you in so many different ways. And, of course, we're always seeking for the Lord to guide us and to lead us and direct us. And uh, obviously, once he shared some of those issues, I, I, I uh, was able to then later on propose that if, I, if this church would have me as a caretaker pastor, what that could look like. Obviously, I could not come here every single week. Uh, I've got a large family to begin with. I don't want to be away from them for too long. I've got two churches that I'm really trying to minister to. But when I look at the Apostle Paul, and uh, of course, he wasn't married, he didn't have kids, so a bit of a different story, but when we look at him and, and uh, how he was able to lead and direct so many churches under his, his authority, and the only way he could really reach out to people was by letter, epistles, yeah. all right, and uh, by sending this person out there, sending Timotheus, sending different people out there, right, to, to be a help and support. I'm thinking, you know what, we live in a world where the world's gotten much smaller with the technology that we have, yeah. you know, uh, we can telephones, internet. Uh, planes, you know, I'm sure the Apostle Paul would have loved to be able to just jump on a plane and get from one place to another. You know, we have a lot of facilities to our disposal. Why don't we use this to try to support and to help this church? So, you know, I, I've, I've already mentioned to Pastor Gary and to Brother Sam, Brother Jordan, a little bit about how we could come alongside and help and maybe be a caretaker pastor to this church. But really, at the end of the day, it's, you know, it's, it's your decisions, guys, and I'm not going to force myself. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the, the, reason, the reason I would propose and, and offer our help and support is simply because we love the brethren. And the reason we have some families that have driven here two hours, four hours to just be here is out of love. Amen. Love of the brethren, you know, and uh, we love not just the brethren, we love good, sound churches. And so what I wanted to preach about today is on this topic of love. I don't want it to be too complicated uh, this morning. And we had the reading there in 2 John. I just want you to point, to point you to verse number 5 in 2 John. It says, And now I beseech thee, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which we had from the beginning, that we love one another. The title for the sermon to this morning is Love One Another. Love one another. And you know what? One thing that I've learned in the seven years that I've been a pastor, we can have people that attend church and visit our church because they're looking for a sound gospel preaching, doctrinally sound church. And, and that's a good reason to find a church. But the main reason people are going to hang around in a church and feel part of the church is because of brotherly love. Amen. If the church is missing brotherly love, it's, you're not going to be able to grow the church very strongly. Like, yeah, sound doctrine is important. The gospel is number one. You know, uh, em emphasizing Christ. You know, he is the foundation. He is the head of every church. But if we don't have brotherly, brotherly love, you can have the greatest teaching, but if they don't feel like I belong in this family, you're not going to find that the church grows. And so I think it's so important. We talk about love and we understand the love of God, but we really need to be able to practice this. And I, I want you to know, uh, for those that are in this church, that we do love you. Uh, you know, I, I have no hesitation. Maybe it's not Australian or manly enough to say that I love you, but I do. I, 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 you know, I've not really met you all until really today. Uh, but I do because I, I love the brethren. This is, this is something that should automatically be part of our Christian life. As much as anything else, as much as our Bible reading, as much as our prayer life, we ought to be loving one another. And so it continues in verse number 6. And this is love. What is love? And this is love. That we walk after his commandments. This is the commandment. That as ye have heard from the beginning, ye should walk in it. Okay, this is something we should do. We should walk in these commandments. And as we follow the commandments that the Lord Christ has set out for us, we are demonstrating our love toward him. And this is, command this is a commandment that we ought to love one another. Okay, we ought to love one another. Now, look, I've got many references uh, to read out today. Um, I don't want it to be too much of a Bible study. If you can turn with me, please turn with me. Come with me quickly now to Leviticus 19 in the Old Testament. Leviticus 19. Uh, there are going to be other references that I'm just going to read off the top of my notes here because, you know, otherwise I'll be taking too long to get through the sermon this morning. But Leviticus 19. 
Uh, I want to turn there because I want to, I want to show you the reference where John said, look, this is, this is, not, this is a, a, not a new commandment. This is something from the beginning that we ought to love one another. And I want to show you where that is found, of course, here in the book of Leviticus 19 and verse number 17. Let's start there. Leviticus 19 and look at verse number 17. Leviticus 19, verse number 17 reads, Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. Thou shalt not avenge, nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. But thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. What does that mean to love your neighbor as yourself? What this essentially means is that we ought to love one another the same way we would like to be loved by others. Right? If I'm hungry, I would love nothing more than to go to the big boys cafe and to, you know, to score a free coffee, free hot chocolate or a free slice of mud cake or something. I don't know what you have for your desserts, right? Uh, that's something that, you know, if, if, we, if I was lacking anything, that I would love for somebody to come along and say, hey, you know, uh, Kevin, here's, here's my coat or here's some shelter. Here's some water. What are your needs? What can I pray for? You know, uh, you know how, how can we assist? And if I would love that kind of help and love shown by others, then I, I ought to be willing to do that to, to those around me, especially, especially my brethren, Amen. especially people in Port Macquarie that are believers that love the Lord Jesus Christ. I should be able to say, hey, you know what? I'm willing to travel four and a half hours to come and visit this church and be a blessing and show some love, show some support. And so we have this interesting commandment, uh, you know, uh, to love your neighbor uh, as thyself, as thyself. Now, I want you to remember this phrase, love thy neighbor as thyself, because I'm going to show you something that I kind of, uh, and maybe this is a very basic teaching, but it's something I uncovered just in my Bible reading as I meditated in God's Word. Um, if you can come with me to Matthew 22, come with me to Matthew 22. This loving your neighbor as just thyself comes up a few times. Of course, when Christ uh, walked this earth, um, he also taught the same teaching. I just want to show you one reference here. In Matthew 22, verse number 34, please. Matthew 22, and thank you for the water. Matthew 22, verse number 34. Matthew 22, 34 says, But when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. Okay, so the Sadducees and the Pharisees, they did not like Christ. They did not like the message of Christ. Okay, and then it says, Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question. That's asked Jesus a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. That's a wonderful commandment. That's a wonderful commandment. To love our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind. You know, I often quite stop and think about how much do I love my Lord? You know, another thing that the Lord adds to this in another passage is to love him with all your might. Okay, and so I often think, yes, do I love you, Lord, do I, with all my heart? And I, and I say, yes, Lord, I, I believe I do. Uh, do I love him with all my might? Uh, yes, and again, for those that would travel, say, two hours, you put the effort in to drive, and, you know, there's the effort, the might, and you're coming for the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. amen. And then I wonder, but do I love him with all my mind, though, you know? Uh, my, my thought life, the things that I think about, the things that I meditate on, the things that are, you know, taking up my mind, do I truly love Jesus with all my mind? I, I often go through this checkbox just every now and again, and I try to assess how well am I loving my Lord God. But anyway, that's not so much a topic of the sermon this morning. It's about loving one another. It continues in verse number 38. This is the first and great commandment. That is the first and great commandment, of course, loving the Lord. But then it says in verse number 39, And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There it is again. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. This is the second greatest commandment found in the Bible. To love thy neighbor as thyself. Then Christ says, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. You know what he's saying? It, Christ is saying, if we want to summarize the Old Testament, okay, all 39 books of the Old Testament, and you know, sometimes it's challenging to get through uh, the Bible. You know, we often start with Genesis, all right, that's all right. We get through Exodus and Leviticus. And then we kind of stop, right? It gets a bit hard. Well, you know what? If you just want to summarize it, summarize it like this. To love the Lord thy God 
and to love thy neighbor as thyself. Amen. Jesus says, if you could just summarize, if you just do those two commandments, you are obeying all of the law and all the prophets, all the law and all the prophets that wrote in the Old Testament scriptures, this is the emphasis, to love the Lord and to love our neighbor. So how important is it to love our brethren? And that's why I say without hesitation that I love you guys. I, I, love, I love Pastor Gary. I love, I love your family already. I love the members of this church already. If you're in Christ Jesus, if you're my brother and sister in the Lord, I, I love it because we're family is what we are. Amen. Isn't that what families do? Yeah. Families love each other. And you know, the, the thing we have in common when it comes to family is our, is our DNA, it's our blood. What, what makes us in common in Christ? The blood of Christ. Amen. Amen. And uh, we, we, uh, we have a heavenly father. We can cry unto him, Abba, Father. Uh, you know, we're joint heirs with his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We're not just saved. We're not just saved sinners, and that's what we are, saved sinners, but we're also sons and daughters of the Heavenly Father. Amen. Joint heirs with Christ. He promises us homes in heaven, mansions, streets of gold, new heaven, new earth. You know, I'm part of the royal family. We're made priests and kings. And uh, what an honor the Lord gives us to be part of his family. And so if, if I appreciate my Heavenly Father as my father, my, my real heavenly father, then I appreciate you guys as my brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ. As I said, there's not that many of us, really, you know, and uh, I don't want to be fighting with you guys. I don't want to be arguing. What, what for? <laughs> there's just so much conflict. Like, you know, I, I'm already fighting with the world and, and the pressures and, the, and society. I'm fighting with my flesh, right? My flesh is always getting in the way and wanting to be selfish. Uh, the flesh versus the spirit, the old man versus the new man. I've got a battle happening here every single day of my life. I don't want to be fighting with my brothers and sisters in the Lord. Amen. I know you've got your own battles that you're fighting with, and I want to come alongside and say I love you, and I'm here for you, and I want to be a friend, and I want to be a help. And if you would accept us, we're, we're more than happy to be a friend and help to you. Um, and we want to be a blessing. And this is what it means to love your neighbor as yourself. Now, let's turn to a few more passages. Actually, come with me to 1 John. Come with me to 1 John now. While you turn to 1 John, I'm going to quickly read to you from Romans 13. You go to 1 John. I'll read to you from Romans 13, verse 8. You go to 1 John. I'll read to you from Romans 13, verse 8. The Bible says, Owe no man anything. So we shouldn't owe anyone anything, but, this is the exception, but to love one another. For he that loveth another have fulfilled the law. Once again, confirming that. If we love one another, we're fulfilling the law. And this is what we owe one another. Do you know that? I owe you love. And you owe me love. And we owe each other love because of what Christ has done for us. It continues, uh, verse number 9, For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Once again, reinforcing, loving your neighbor as yourself is the fulfilling of the law. Look, I know, I don't know, I can't remember how many commandments there are in the Old Testament. I hear there's 600 and something. <laughs> okay? And all I need to do is keep one of them. Love my neighbor as myself and I'm fulfilling the whole law. That makes it a lot easier, isn't it? To be able to do that one thing and not to think ill. And, you know, I, I always despise, and this happens in churches, when people look down on other Christians, uh, when people criticize other believers, uh, you know, um, almost this sense of, you know, being superior as a believer. And one thing I never wanted to be as a pastor was to be seen as superior, now, the office is important, you know, and the office ought to be honored. But, you know, at the end of the day, I got saved just like you did. Amen. I couldn't save myself. I was a sinner in the sight of God. I needed a savior just like everybody else. And I knew that Christ paid for all of my sins just as much as he paid for all of your sins. And we've been saved exactly the same way. Regardless of how much you've messed up your life or not messed up your life, we had to enter salvation for the same manner, uh, through Christ alone, faith in Christ alone. And so who are we to be more superior than the other? Because what saves us is not our righteousness, is it? It's the imputed righteousness of Christ that's been upon us. When we stand before God in heaven, he's going to see us through the clothing, the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, not our efforts and our abilities. And, and so I just find that, you know, criticizing other believers 
uh, and, and brothers, just, just a waste of time. Who are we? You know, without Christ, you'd be on your way to hell. He loved you so much and he died for you, took your place, became your substitute. And so, you know, I, I love this commandment that we ought to love one another. And uh, you're there in 1 John ch- verse number, uh, chapter 2, please. 1 John chapter 2. I want to show you something that maybe you've never really thought about before. I remember growing up reading this passage and I just did not understand for the longest, longest time. Okay? Because what, what I've shown you here is that loving your neighbor as yourself is an old commandment. We see it from the very beginning, the books of Moses. All right? From the early scriptures, we see these commandments. But then we have 1 John chapter 2 and verse number 7. Look what John says here. He says, Brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment which you had from the beginning. Oh, yep, yep, we had that. We saw that in Leviticus. All right, let's continue. The old commandment is the word which you have heard from the beginning. Then he says this in verse number 8. Again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past and the true light now shineth. I remember I used to read this and go, oh, John, what are you saying? And oh, I'm not telling you, like, it's an old commandment you've had from the beginning, and now I'm, I'm giving you a new commandment? I'm like, what? Like, what? What are you talking about? Let's continue. Verse number 9. It says here, uh, it says, uh, verse number 9, He that uh, saith he is in the light, and hateth his brother, is in darkness even until now. Now, I want to give you a little bit of context very quickly. In 1 John chapter 1, we're told and we're taught how to remain in fellowship with our Lord God. Okay? And the way uh, we are to remain in fellowship is to remember that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. But you know, when we commit sin, when we do wrong, when we walk away from the Lord and we're selfish and we chase our own desires, we enter and walk in darkness. You don't lose salvation. Once you're born into God's family, you cannot be unborn. It's everlasting life. Amen. What a promise. Our position with God never changes, but our walk is affected when we walk in sin, when we walk in darkness. And when we walk in darkness, and God who has no darkness is, is light, we break fellowship with our Heavenly Father. We're not walking with the Lord. We can become in a backslidden state. And so the commandment at the end of 1 John chapter 1 is to confess our sins. All right, that we ought to confess our sins and the Lord Jesus Christ forgives us of those sins and we're reunited with God in fellowship one with another. Amen. So it's important when we talk about being in the light, this is not talking about how to be saved, but rather how to maintain our walk and fellowship with our Lord God. So it's saying here that if we hate our brother, that we're in darkness even until now. You know what? I can come to church and I'm not saying that this, I'm just Hypothetically, I can come to church and hate my brother and sister in the Lord. All right. Oh, why didn't brother so and so say hello to me this week? You know, why did sister so and so? Oh, whatever. Whatever reasons. If you've been in church, there's plenty of reasons. You've probably heard them all. Why people don't like each other. Okay. And you come. People come to church and they don't like each other. They ignore each other, criticize, judge each other. Okay. And the Bible tells me if that's the way you act to your brother, you're in darkness. Which tells me you're not walking in the light of Christ at this point in your life. So look, this is so important. It's not just the love that we ought to have for one another. Loving one another maintains our fellowship with God. Our walk with our Lord. Okay, And we begin to hate and to uh, bite one another. We're in darkness. And this affects our, our fellowship and our walk with the Lord. He continues in verse number 10. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light. There it is. And there is none occasion of stumbling in him. So if I love you, I'm in fellowship with my Lord God. I'm doing the right thing. I'm doing exactly what the Lord God wants in my life. To love the brothers and sisters that he's put in my life. Verse number 11. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness. And walketh in darkness. Remember I told you? It's your walk. You walk in darkness. And knoweth not whither he goeth. Because that darkness hath blinded his eyes. Darkness hath blinded his eyes. I want you to remember this. You know, if if you can't find love for your brothers and sisters in the Lord, and you think you're right with God, you're not. You're not right with God. You may think you are, but you're blinded. Okay? You might think you're walking clearly, but you're blinded. It's so important. It's such such an important passage, right? To, To love one another, to be here for each other, to help each other, to pray for one another, 
to, to fulfill the needs for what of one another, if we can be utilized by God to do so. And so I don't want to be in darkness. Do you? Do you want to be in darkness? Do you want to have broken fellowship with God? Do you want to be so dark that you're blind that you don't know which way you're going? Of course, when you're blind, you're going to start walking into things and damaging your life. I don't want that. So the simple solution is to just love the brethren. Amen. Amen. And I do. I can tell you with a whole heartedness that I do love this church and I love your pastor and I love the families here and I love the visitors. I love our church members. I love the brothers and sisters that the Lord God has put in my life. It's important. And I know there are some that I'm going to get along better than others. Right? And it's just personalities can be that way. But at the end of the day, I don't want to see people's lives destroyed. I want to see them walking faithfully with the Lord, you know, furthering his kingdom, earning rewards in heaven, you know, doing the great things that God has equipped us with, with his, the hope of his Holy Spirit. But to love one another. Now, as I said, it's quite what I always wondered about John there. He says, look, I'm not writing a new commandment, but then he says, here's a new commandment. And we know that, of course, it has to do with loving our brethren. So I want to bring you, now that's, of course, 1 John's written by John. Well, let's go to the actual book of John, because this explains it further. John, please, John 13. John 13, we're going to look at the words of Jesus Christ. And uh, another thing that I discovered as I would read my Bible is that if I wanted to understand what 1 John or 2 John or 3 John is sometimes talking about, the best book to turn to is the book of John. Okay, because uh, most, most of the fundamentals are, are, are delivered there. And then, of course, John builds on those fundamentals in 1 John, 2 John, 3 John. But in John 13, verse number 34, these are the words of Jesus. He says, A new commandment I give unto you. So this is the new commandment that John was talking about. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another. Now, again, you're probably wondering, how, that's not the new commandment, Pastor Kevin. You just told us that this was an old commandment found in the book of Leviticus. So what's new about it? Well, let's look at it again. Uh, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another. Look at this. As I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. Amen. So what's the new commandment? That we ought to love one another as thyself? No. As I, Jesus, have loved you. Wow. How much greater is that love? How much higher of a standard is this new commandment versus the old commandment? The old commandment was a good one. To love one another as thyself. What a good old commandment. But then a better new commandment is to love one another in the same way that Christ has loved me. Whoa. Because how much has Christ loved me? He gave his life for me. That's how much he loved me. That, you know, as an enemy of God who was uh, sinning against my Lord God, who had no way of salvation in my own righteousness. You know, my Lord God, who is holy and mighty and powerful, the creator of all things, a God who has no darkness in him, decided to make himself of no reputation, to make himself a servant in the likeness of men, to be obedient unto death, to take my sin to take your sin, to take even the sins I've yet committed and to take it upon himself and be punished by his father. To take the wrath of God in my place to become the curse, to become sin. And that's the love that Christ had for me. Amen. And I've got to love you in the same way that Christ loves me. Whoa. There are, at this point, there are no excuses to not love our brethren. Are there any excuses? You say, well, my brother so-and-so did something against me. Well, every sin I've ever committed was against God and he still loved me enough to die for me. Right. What excuses? Look, nobody's going to sin against you more than you've sinned against God. And Christ says, this is the standard by which we are to love one another, the same way that Christ loved me. That's the new commandment. What a great commandment that is. And not like, brethren, like, I'm, I'm, I'm saying there is no excuses there are, there are no excuses to hate the brethren. There are no excuses to hate your church members. There are no excuses to hate the people of God. No excuses. Okay? We are commanded to love one another as Christ loved us. And you and I both know we're not really going to achieve that till he takes us home to be in heaven because our failings that we have as human beings. But this tells me, you know what, with everything that I have, you know, whatever sacrifice is needed, you know, as long as I have the ability, I have the strength, 
that I'm here to serve and to love one another. And uh, can you come with me also to John 15? You're not far away. Come with me to John 15. John 15, verse number 9. Now, obviously, we understand the love of Christ toward us. Well, what about this? In John 15, verse number 9, Christ says, As the Father have loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. So just in case you can't figure out how much does Christ love me? Well, I just told you he died for you. Well, now Christ says, all right, well, the love that the Father has for his Son, the love that God is love, by the way, <laughs> the love that God the Father has for God the Son ought to be that of the love. He says that's how he's loved us. And so if that's how he's loved us, then that's how we ought to love one another. Again, the standard's even higher. I ought to love you in the same measure that God the Father loves God the Son. And the, and, and the Lord God is in, you know, we, we serve one God in three persons. Our Lord God is in unity. Uh, Jesus Christ always submitted his will to the Father's will. And Christ, of course, was that perfect sacrifice that the Father sent in our place. And it's this love, the love that God the Father has for God the Son, is the love that Christ gives to us. And that's the love that we ought to have one for another. I mean, what a standard. What a standard. I, I, I just, I, I, I'm preaching this, but I realize I come short. <laughs> Even of this standard, right? Because of the flesh, because of the selfish desires that we have. And, uh, but I'm, I'm telling you, there's, there's, there's a wonderful blessing. There's a wonderful blessing. And not just the wonderful blessing, but the fact that if we obey this truth, we are obeying the law. Okay? We are obeying the law that, uh, and the standard by which God would have us to live. It continues in verse number 10. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, look at this, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. Brethren, sometimes when we think about loving one another and the sacrifice needed, and sometimes we have to maybe not naturally want to love somebody, but you know what, God told me to anyway, I'm going to do it. Well, Christ says they promise, if we're able to follow this commandment, that our joy would be full. Fullness of joy. I don't know about you, but I want to be a happy person. I, I really, look, does, does life throw some curveballs? You know, is life challenging? Are there tribulations? Are there difficulties? Are, is there a time of sorrow? Of course there is. Okay? But you know what? One thing I definitely want in my life, I, I want my, I, I, I'd rather live... I'm 43, I believe. <laughs> and if the Lord will allow me to live to 50, I just want to make sure the last seven years of my life is a joyful one, rather than live to 100 and be downcast and depressed. And say, so how can I increase my joy? How can I be sure that I can have fullness of joy? Well, to love one another, Amen. to love my brethren, to love you the way that the Father loves his Son, the way that Christ loves me. If I can fulfill this, I know that there's going to be a joy unspeakable that comes from my heart and life will be worth living. The quality of life will improve simply by loving my brothers and sisters in the Lord. Amen. And then he says in verse number 12, This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Okay, and of course, who's the one that laid down his life? Christ. And he calls us his friends. You know, I was once his enemy. We were once his enemy, and now he calls us his friends. He says, you know what? I love you so much. I lay down my life. You're my friend. And I want you to know, uh, Crown Baptist Church, that you're my friend. I love you, you know. And uh, our church loves you. I want you to know that. And, you know, I I know you might feel like, and I don't know, I don't know who grew up in Port Macquarie, but it's kind of out there, right? (laughs) It's not a Sydney. It's not a Melbourne. It's not a Brisbane. And it might feel a little bit lonely, but I want you to know that you've got brothers and sisters in Queensland and down in Sydney that love you very much and that would call you a friend, okay? And I'd love, I'd love to, you know, be, uh, be more of a friend to you guys as time goes on. I'd love to be more of a friend to you, Pastor Gary, if, if, you'd, if you would like that to be the case. <laughs> because I've got to come out. I want, to, I want my joy to be full. I want that. I want my joy to be full. I want us to be able to serve and help one another. And if I demonstrate love to you, I know that that love is going to be returned back to me. And even if it's not returned back to me in human form, I know that's a love that Christ has given me. And I owe man to love him the way that Christ loved me. 
But again, you say, well, hold on, Pastor. How do we do this? How do we fulfill verse number 13? Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. We know that Christ laid down his life. Is God asking that we would actually physically die one for another? Some people have interpreted it like that. I don't believe that's the case because here's the thing. I can't die for your sins. Christ could die for my sins. But he set us the example. He set us the example of sacrifice. Okay? And I can't sacrifice my life for your sins. I, forget about it. I can't even sacrifice myself for my own sins. That's why I needed a savior to begin with. But whatever, whatever God gives us, whatever resources, whatever cap, uh, capabilities God gives us, if we're able to sacrifice a little... You know, one of the things... You know, if you would have me to be a caretaker pastor for you, is that we would send brethren to come up and preach on a Sunday uh, so it would not fall heavy upon uh, Brother Jordan and Brother Sam. Or, you know, we would have some helpers to get behind the pulpit. And again, that's going to require uh, people to drive uh, four and a half hours up here and four and a half hours back. Well, that's a sign of sacrifice, right? You're, you're giving up those hours. You're giving up that day. You're giving up that weekend to come and be uh, a support and to show love one for another, to lay down life for friends. And again, I, I, would, I would have you please think about whether you would have me as your pastor. You know, uh, seek the Lord. You know, please uh, make sure you always seek the Lord for these kinds of questions and, and uh, you know, make sure that it's definitely the Lord's will and I'm, I'm doing the same from my end. But I, I do want you to know that you are appreciated. You know, we need... We need more churches. You know, we need more pastors. We need, uh, especially in Australia, you know, America's fine. They're fine. <laughs> They've got an independent Baptist church on every corner of every street. And, you know, we don't have all that many. What, I don't know if it's like 150 IFB churches throughout Australia. It's not much, really, when you think about how spread out we are. And there's, there's reasons why, again, I have friends that travel hours to just visit our church just to get plugged in with brethren and, and, and feel like they're, they're part of a community and to feel loved and to show love is because we just don't have that many churches. Amen. And so I'm very thankful for Pastor Gary to have come here to Port Macquarie to start a work here. And again, I understand that there are decisions that need to be made, but if you would have me, if you would allow me to show love and, and sacrifice toward this church, I'm more than willing to do it. And so are other brethren from the churches. Amen. Can I point you to another passage? If you come with me to Romans chapter 12, Romans chapter 12 and verse number 9. Romans chapter 12 and verse number 9, please. Romans chapter 9, chapter, Romans chapter, did I say it wrong? Romans chapter 12, just in case I got it wrong. Romans chapter 12, verse number 9. Now, we're all trying our best. We, we know we're, we don't love each other perfectly the way that Christ loved us. And we're, that's the goal, that's what we're aiming for, Right? But we don't want to be a church like this either. That says in Romans 12, 9, let love be without dissimulation. The word dissimulation, is, it's like a simulator. A simulator is like not real, but close to real. Okay? And so when you look at this, it's like we don't want our love to be fake. All right? And uh, it's got to come from within. It's, it's got to come from the Lord. All right, and uh, it continues there. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Look at this. Be kindly affectionate, affectionate one to another with brotherly love, in honor, preferring one another. Preferring one another. You know what? When I come to church, I ought to be looking at my church family and go, I prefer you more than myself. Preferring one, you know, uh, one another. This is real love. When you're able to look at someone else and say, how can I serve? How can I be faithful to my church? How can I serve the brethren? These are the questions that we ought to seek for when we come uh, within, with, with church, in church. And to say, hey, I'm going to esteem other better than myself. I'm going to prefer the brethren. And when you do that, that makes it easier to serve one another. Because, you know, when you think about service, we all think about service uh, of, of one being higher than another. Like when you have a job, you have an employer, and as an employee, you go and you serve what the employer needs. And we understand that kind of relationship. But you know, when I come to the house of God, I ought to be looking at my brethren and say, you know what, I'm going to esteem you better than myself. I'm going to prefer you. And therefore, in that case, I'm going to be able to humble myself and serve in whatever capacity that is. 
whether it's cleaning up the building, setting up the chairs, packing up the chairs, whatever it is that is needed in the house of God for you to say, you know what, I'm willing to serve, I'm willing to lower myself. I don't want this to be a fake love. Okay, I want this to be real. I want to be like Christ who lowered himself and became a servant unto death. Then with that attitude is how we ought to come to the house of God and serve and love one another. If you, I'm going to, actually, I'm going to read it to you. I'm going to read it to you from 1 Peter 1.22, which reads, Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto, look at this, unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. Unfeigned love. Because if you've been in church long enough, and you've probably visited different churches, you walk into that church and you know the love is feigned or fake. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's pretend. It's put on. And we're being instructed. And, and I, I often ask myself the question, why are we being instructed not to have unfeigned love? Why are we being instructed to let, let our love be without dissimulation? It's because if we're not careful, we can become this way. It, it can just be a show. It can just be pretend. But what we learn here is to have unfeigned love for the brethren. See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. That word fervent means uh, like passionately, uh, like zealously. Okay? We ought to have this love one for another. And I, I really want you to think about this. And, and you say, well, I, I just don't have it, Pastor Kevin. How do I develop it? And what we saw earlier was remind yourself what Christ has done for you. How is it that my Lord God, creator of all things, would be willing to lower himself and die for me? What love is that? The love of God on show, on display. And if Christ is able to do that for me, then I'm surely, I can just do something small, like pick up the rubbish around the church building rather than complain, which child did this and which family left that? You know what? I'm willing to lower myself out of pure uh, love, Fervent love for the brethren, I'm ready to serve whatever capacity you can. Yeah. Lord. You know, one of the most humbling ways, and I don't know who's got the job here to do that, but one of the most humbling ways to serve the brethren, I'll be honest, is just to clean the toilets. You know, and uh, one, of the, one of the best ways that I grew as a Christian was to say to my pastor, Pastor, do you need someone to clean the toilets? I'm willing to do it. Because you know what? It's behind the scenes. Nobody sees it. Okay? And uh, if the toilets aren't clean, someone's going to complain. Okay? <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's not, always, it's not always neat and tidy. The kids can miss. All right? People forget to flush. All right? Whatever it is, it can be quite dirty. And, and to be able to lower yourself and clean and say, look, there's no external reward. No, one's gonna, no one thanks you for cleaning the toilets. But if they're not clean, they're going to criticize <laughs> okay, okay. But I'm willing to do this and I, I get no rewards on this earth. But Lord God, you see it and you see my love for the brethren. This is something that I'm willing to do. Boy, what rewards in heaven will God lay up for you? You know, what demonstration of love is that truly? Like, that is something surely, something simple. Serving the brethren in, in such a way is a demonstration of love. You're lowering yourself to serve one another. And look, if you say, Pastor, I have a hard time loving the brethren. I have a hard time serving the brethren. I have a hard time lowering myself and, uh, and, and esteeming other better than myself. Then I'd say to you, go clean the toilets. It will teach you a few things. <laughs> it will teach you a few things of humility and love and patience. And reminding yourself that if nobody sees what I'm doing, the Lord God sees it. And he's going to reward me in heaven. Um, let's turn to another passage. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, please. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. Now, if we try to love one another in our own strength, it will be fake. Okay? I, I want to give you the answer. How do I love the brethren the way that Christ loves me? What is this standard, such a high standard? How do I do it? Well, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 gives us some instructions here in verse number 11. It says, Now God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you, and the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another. I want to read verse number 12 again. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love 
one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. So you say, Pastor Kevin, I'm lacking in love. I'm willing to acknowledge that within myself. What do I do? You go to the Lord. It's the Lord that makes you increase and abound in love one toward another. You know what? You run to God, you get a hold of God in prayer and say, Lord, I am selfish. Lord, I want to be served. Lord, I I recognize what the Bible says. I recognize what this strange guest preacher is saying. And uh, and I realize within myself that I am not loving the brethren that uh, that I ought to. Lord, I I realize that when I leave church, I'm critical about this brother or critical about this family. And I don't want to be that way, Lord. I don't want to be in darkness. I want to love. I want to serve. And Lord, you promised me in your word that you're the one that can increase and abound my love to my brethren. Lord, will you give me some of that love? Will you give me a dose of the love that you have toward me that I can then show that to my brothers and sisters in the Lord? And look, I know my Lord answers prayers. I know God answers prayers. And I know that's a prayer that God will answer. God will answer that prayer. I'm not, he's not going to answer the prayer for the Ferrari. Okay, or, or maybe he will. I don't know. <laughs> All right, but I, I'm just saying that the one prayer that I know God will answer, if you say, Lord, increase my love. You know, increase my love. Increase my love for uh, Crown Baptist Church. Increase my love for Pastor Gary. Increase my love for this family and that family and this brother and this sister. You know what? In time, if you're seeking that, he will give it to you. Okay, because God is love. There's no other source of true love than God himself. And look what it says in verse number 13. To the end, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. This is telling me that our growth in love one for another will continue and finally be established at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why is that important? Because at the coming of Christ is when we receive our resurrected bodies, our bodies without sin, our bodies without corruption, our bodies that are immortal, our bodies that will not be selfish. And I can't wait for the day that the Lord gives me a new body that will line up with my spirit that he's given me, the resurrected spirit within me, where I'm not fighting the flesh anymore, and I can truly love the brethren the way that Christ loved me. Amen. So, we don't, I'm looking forward to it, my hope is there, but I can start on that journey today. To love one another as Christ loved me. Now, you're there in 1 Thessalonians. Come with me to one more passage and we'll end the service. So, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, please. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And verse number 9. The Bible reads, But as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God, To love one another. Do you see the same thing? For ye yourselves are taught of God. God teaches us how to love one another. He gave us the example. He sacrificed his son. Christ laid down his life. This is the love that he has for you. He sets the example. And he's our teacher of how we can love one another. And then he says this to the Thessalonian church. And indeed, ye do it toward all the brethren which are in all Macedonia. And we beseech you, brethren that ye increase more and more. So the Thessalonian church is being recognized of loving the brethren, but not only just loving the brethren of its local church. It says here that they do love, uh, and indeed you do it toward all the brethren that are in all Macedonia. So the Thessalonian church was in Macedonia, but there were other churches in Macedonia as well. And you know what? When people spoke of the Thessalonian church, you know what they said? This is a church that loves this is a church that loves the brethren. This is, this is a testimony of our church. And what I want to say to you, Crown Baptist Church, is that you are loved. You know, I can't speak for every church in Australia, but I can speak for two. I can speak for New Life Baptist Church and I can speak for Blessed Up Baptist Church. You are loved. We've been praying for your church. Okay, we've been praying for your pastor. We've been praying for the families in this church. You know, we love you. We love you very much. And, you know, if there's anything that you walk away from the sermons today, I want you to know that you are appreciated. You're important in the eyes of God. You've got a work, you've got a mission to complete here in Port Macquarie. There are souls that need to be saved. There are, there are believers that need to get plugged into a good church and learn some sound doctrine and just to be able to experience and exercise the love by which God wants us to, to live by. This is an important church, Crown Baptist Church. 
I love the name of the church, in fact, the crown. Yeah, you know what? That's, that's what I, 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 I love. I love for us to be in the eyes of God, something of purity, of richness, of value, of rarity. You know, a crown here in Port Macquarie that gives glory to our Lord Jesus Christ. The title for the sermon was Love, Love One Another, Love One Another. And I hope you can exercise these things. I, you know, please remember uh, that you ought to love one another as, you know, as, um, as yourself, as thyself. You know, the same way that you would like to be loved, make sure you do that to others. But then you see when Christ comes on the scene, the new commandment, he lifts the standard. He always does. Christ always lifts the standard. <laughs> you know, when he speaks about adultery, he says, well, if, if you've looked at a woman with lust, you've committed adultery with her in your, in your heart, in your heart. You know, Christ is always lifting that standard in the New Testament and showing that it's not just the outward, but also what is happening within us that's important. And you know, brethren, we ought to love one another as Christ has loved us. What a mighty standard and what a mighty love that God has toward us. And again, if you think, Pastor, I fail in this area. Look, I, I, I can't change your life, but I know the one that can, and that's the Lord God. He's the one that can make you abound and increase in love. And please find a way that you can be of help and service to this church and the brothers and sisters here. And as you serve one another, your love will increase and grow with the help of your Lord God. Okay, let's pray.